To put it differently, Europeanization as a process of catching up with the contemporary civilization has been a significant source of transformation in Turkey since the Tanzimat reforms. At various times, Europeanization, European politics have forced Ottoman statesmen or the Republican elite to take reformist steps. Similar to the constitutional uh, rule in 1876, for modern Turkey, the EU membership process has strengthened human rights, democratization, civil society in Turkey. The EU accession process has necessitated the consolidation of Turkish democracy in accordance with the Copenhagen criteria, ranging from civil military relations to the Kurdish question. More importantly, this process has provided an opportunity for the ruling uh, Justice and Development Party, an opportunity space to transform the bureaucratic authoritarian state structure and institutionalize a democratic process. Certainly the relationship between the Union and Turkey is not one-sided. Turkey has always been influential in the making of Europe since the foundation of the Ottoman Empire. For long centuries, Turkey was considered as member of European state system, often as the other of Europe, sometimes as the Sikh of men, Sikh men of Europe, but Turkey has always been a part of the European history and shaped it. Today we must admit that Turkey's membership presents Europe a significant challenge to be tackled. Increasingly self-confident Turkey is not an ordinary applicant country. New Turkey is trying to transform itself into a global power. It is sure that accession of a new and ambitious Turkey into the EU would have a great impact on the EU institutions, decision-making procedures, budget, regional policies, and migration. Turkey is the only applicant country which would have the power to change the center of gravity in all fields in the EU mechanisms. Although accession negotiations with Turkey commenced in 2005, both the European capitals and Ankara seem to suffer from, for, from a Euro fatigue in the last six years due to different reasons. The European Union is immersed in its economic problems and troubled by the resurgent nationalist trend. Any progress on Turkey's accession process is blocked by the major EU countries, namely uh, Germany and France. Moreover, Turkey's accession has become an element of domestic politics in the EU member states despite the start of accession negotiations. Turkey-EU accession negotiations consist of 35 chapters. Among these, only one chapter is successfully concluded, and negotiations on 12 chapters are still continuing. Eight chapters are frozen due to vetoes by Cyprus, France, or the European Council as a whole. I hope that the current deadlock in accession talks will not end up in turning a de facto deadlock into a permanent one. The debate on Turkey's identity and on its Europeanness should not be resulted in strengthening the idea of European fortress. European leaders should be brave to redefine European identity in the way that it could be a place of harmony and coexistence for different identities and civilizations. They should stop questioning the very possibility of a European future for Turkey. Despite the current deadlock in the negotiations, the EU process is still a strategic asset for Turkish foreign and domestic politics. 
One of the main objectives of the recent Turkish foreign policy activism is to build interdependencies in its surrounding regions to reduce the, to reduce the potential uh, for conflict. And this goal resonates well with the EU's neighborhood policy and the Union for the Mediterranean. Furthermore, Turkey's increasing attractiveness among the neighbors is also very, relate, very closely related to Turkey's political and economic transformation in the accession process. EU can play a role in supporting a new constructive engagement between the Turkish government and opposition parties on the reform agenda from drafting a new constitution to find to a renewed uh, effort of uh, addressing the Kurdish question democratically. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, the present Turkey-EU relations are at one of the lowest points in years, especially at a time when significant changes are taking place in the Middle East and North Africa. To some observers, the Arab Spring is the most important development of the early, early 21st century with potential consequences greater than 9-11. Arab uprisings are the beginning of a long process for a transition to a stable democracy. It would take long years for Tunisia and Egypt to consolidate their democracies just as it has taken a long time to do the same for Turkey. This process may result in reversals, chaos, and civil conflict. The Arab Spring has created new challenges for all the international and regional actors involved, including the EU and Turkey. Turkey is the only consolidated democracy in the region which can have a demonstrative effect as an inspiring example for the all stages and parameters of democratic transition and consolidation. If certain member states can, have, can leave behind their post-colonial ambitions towards the region, the EU also can be a promoter for democratization and economic development in the region. In fact, Turkey and EU can cooperate in dealing with these problems of transition, consolidation, and economic development in the region. The cooperation would contribute to constitution-making practices, peaceful transfer of power to new elites, and economic development. The EU-Turkey cooperation can offer more systematic and well thought out assistance on issues ranging from the organization of free and fair elections to the development of administrative and legal structures supportive of a free civil society. This cooperation will, may turn the current impasse into just another phase in Turkey's EU relations and it will convey a positive message to the Muslim world. It will offer much needed reassurance that when both the EU and Turkey are ready, membership will be on the agenda even in the future. It will also renew both parties' commitment to reform and integration while decreasing mutual distrust. As you see, I. I have tried to make a general picture of the relations between EU and Turkey uh, somehow in a positive way at a time of uh, stagnation in the relations. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Professor Dura. That we will continue with the, His Excellency uh, Professor Milan Yazbets. That uh, before inviting him to the floor, that I just w want to give the, the short bio. But it's he has really extraordinary, <laughs> extraordinary bio. But uh, uh, how can I shorten it? It is a little bit difficult. But I was trying to do the more concise one. But sorry for. The, 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 the short ones, but I will st say that starting with the, he studied journalism and the defense studies at University of Ljubljana, then, the join, then joined the Yugoslavia foreign ministry. 
Then there he completed the, the Diplomatic Academy of the Federal Secretariat of Foreign Affairs of Yugoslavia, then continued uh, work there as a consul and the consulate in different places. Then since its independence in 1992, he's working for the Slovenian Foreign Ministry as head of consulate department, uh, planning, uh, policy planning and the research director and state secretary for the defense ministry. Then since 2010, he is ambassador, uh, Slovenian ambassador to Turkey and also accredited to Azerbaijan, Lebanon and Syria. And today I had also to heard that he will also accredited to the Iraq as well. And uh, in 2005, he received the, the grand golden decoration of honor with star for merit for the Republic of, the Republic of Austria. Beside all this professional work, he is also a prominent scholar of international relations, uh, especially focusing on the diplomacy studies. And he completed his PhD on sociology of diplomacy at Kragenfurt Austria, in Austria, and he wrote around he he's, he wrote around 20 books and more than 150 articles relating to the diplomacy relating to diplomacy security and the defense issues among them just diplom uh, diplomacies of new small state the case of slovenia with the some comparison from the baltics and also rainbow beyond the soul a novel on diplomacy and security and diplomacy in the western balkans these are the, the, the sum of the, his books. And apart from the, all this, he is also editor of the, the journal on European perspective to the, today. We will discuss on about the, the special issue of Turkey. Floor is yours, please. Well, uh, hello uh, from uh, this uh, chair here. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, nice presentation. You know, uh, I never, I'm never sure with these presentations when I listen to presentations about other people, is it everything true or not, and so on. So also when I was listening to this, what you uh, said about me, sometimes I say, well, okay, I mean, hopefully I did all this, what you tell me, <laughs> told about me. So. Uh, I'm very glad to be here uh, at uh, your dis esteemed university. Uh, I'm glad, uh, especially because of th this is a scholar issue, academic discussion and presentation of, of the new uh, issue of our uh, journal, uh, European Perspectives. Uh, so I'm uh, double headed, how shall I say, an ambassador of Slovenia to Turkey, and I'm also uh, editor of this journal. I've been editor since the, big, uh, the first issue, so uh, two years and a half. Uh, we have uh, agreed at our board meeting uh, somewhere in spring this year, that let's do a special issue on uh, Turkey for various reasons. Uh, so uh, I'm glad that we managed to do this. Uh, to, to, to do this. Uh, but again, let me express my thanks and gratitude to the, to the university, to the vice rector, to the head of international uh, relations. So I'm very glad that you accepted this, our idea. I wish to present the journal here uh, in Istanbul. We will also have one presentation in Ankara. I don't know yet where it will be and when. So, so we are here. Um, maybe a few words at the beginning uh, uh, about uh, this, uh, let's say, my work as the ambassador of Slovenia to Turkey. Uh, I came here last September, in the beginning of September, uh, so it's a year and two months. Uh, uh, we had a visit of our Prime Minister to your country at the beginning of March this year, and uh, upon the initiative of the Embassy, uh, the two Prime Ministers signed the strategic partnership between Turkey and Slovenia. Uh, this is a very important uh, act uh, for Slovenia, I guess also for your country. Uh, your Prime Minister said at the press conference after the meeting that for him this is the peak in the diplomatic relations between the two countries. And uh, speaking uh, about the diplomatic relations between the two countries, I have to say I'm very pleased with, uh, about this and very honored that uh, next year 
in 2012, we will celebrate the 20th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Slovenia and Turkey. Slovi uh, Turkey recognized Slovenia on the 2nd of February 1992 among the first uh, countries. This was very important and still is for our country. And uh, so uh, basically my, my work here is framed with this uh, uh, strategic partnership and uh, with this uh, anniversary which, will be ce which we will celebrate next year. Uh, so it means that everything what we'll be doing next year will be done under this slogan and we will also invent to say so some some events with which we will mark this. For example, one uh, such a topic uh, or issue will be we are uh, uh, translating four books from Slovenian language to Turkish language. We will uh, publish them, each of these books in 5,000 copies, have presentations around uh, the country and so on. One of these books uh, uh, is or will be a diplomatic diary from 1530, so from the time, uh, from the time of the uh, uh, Sultan Suleiman uh, the Magnificent. In 1530, uh, almost uh, half a millennia ago, two uh, diplomats from uh, Vienna, from Habsburg court, uh, left to Constantinople to have uh, diplomatic negotiations with the Sultan and with the Grand Vizier. And since they didn't uh, know the language, they hired a monk in Ljubljana, a Slovene uh, person, uh, as a translator. And the monk, having, uh, 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 I guess, some of the scholar, academic manners and patience, uh, he was writing the diary all the way from Ljubljana to Constantinople and back. So, and out of this, uh, extremely thrilling and still current actual uh, book appeared or diary and we will translate this uh, book to English and the Turkish and we will have a three language edition with which we will uh, let's say open some history to, to the today's generations and uh, uh, with which uh, we would like to uh, show and to present that uh, also relations between Big Turkey and small Slovenia have an old tradition uh, and that we have contacts in future and in the past ever since to say so. Um, then now a few words about, uh, about the journal. We heard uh, some from the opening remarks. Uh, this journal was established uh, uh, two years ago. This is uh, the fifth issue. It's, it is a biannual uh, journal uh, coming out each uh, April and uh, October. Uh, the title is European Perspectives. It means uh, the title says that uh, the journal is uh, devoted to the European perspective of the Western Balkans and to everything what is related to this topic. Uh, we have in each issue five articles plus some others in other, other uh, uh, sections, not in the main section. We have in this uh, issue uh, seven articles. Uh, focusing on Turkey, mainly uh, they have in mind this uh, EU-Turkish relation, but from various points of view, for example, there is one article very challenging, I like it very much, bridging the gender gap in Turkish politics, the actors promoting female representation, the, the article includes already or analyzes already the elections uh, which were held in June this year, there is also then one interesting article about post-secular society, whatever does this mean. So uh, it's a good selection. I'm glad that articles are not focused on classical topics which are in the air, but on so, or, or typical, but on some topics which are challenging, let's say, which present this, uh, uh, the, the case of Turkey, to say so, from uh, some not daily seen uh, or uh, contemplated topics. And in each issue we have uh, of course, letter from the editor, but this is not something of a big uh, importance. In, in each uh, issue, we have a guest view from a prominent uh, person uh, uh, not being active in the politics anymore and having uh, uh, a touch for uh, uh, academic contemplation. I'm very proud, I'm very glad that we have in this uh, issue the guest view from the ninth president of the Republic, from Mr. Uh, His Excellency Sule Suleiman de Merel. He was uh, glad and, and, and uh, uh, kind enough to contribute his overview on the Turkish uh, development during last decades. Uh, 
So that much about the, the, the issue, or the, 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 the current uh, uh, special issue. You can, I, I hope you take it, took it outside, so the issue is there, you know, uh, at, the, at the entrance, be free to, to take a copy for, uh, for your personal use. I was told that there should be also two authors, uh, two contributors among the audience. If they are here, I would like that they come later to me that we also give the three uh, copies to, to the authors. I don't know the, the, the people, so if anybody of you is the author of these articles, please let me know later. So that much for this, let's say, first part of my uh, discussion. Second part, uh, let me contemplate a little bit about the EU-Turkish relations from, let's say, selected uh, points of view. Selected, not that I made a special selection, but more as they would come on my mind when I discuss this and uh, to a certain extent, so a certain extent also improvise. Uh, I would like to start with the notion of the integration process. Uh, I would say that the integration process is that force, that unseen force, uh, maybe also a kind of a ghost in the castle, which has changed the European uh, outlook during the last few decades. Uh, needless to go into the details, but still we know that it started uh, with a, a kind of uh, basic economic community ag agreement in, 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 in uh, the uh, already in late uh, 40s. It was formali for formalized in mid 50s. And then the more the process or the, this uh, uh, in, uh, integration was on the way, it was res uh, getting uh, also additional aspects, not only this purely economic ambition or ambition to be uh, uh, integrated on the economic area. Especially important, as we know, it was the, this, uh, uh, the decision to integrate also on in the area of uh, uh, common foreign policy and security and, and, and defense policy, and especially later at the end of the 90s, at the end of the previous century, the, the monetary union. Uh, so I think if we look at it this way, from this way, to, to the enlargement uh, the process of the European Community, European Union, we can think, we can see that uh, uh, a kind of a integration process emerged out of all these activities. We also have the, uh, uh, as we know, the, 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 the uh, uh, four or now they say five freedoms, we, five freedoms which uh, uh, connect European continent. So if we look backwards from this perspective, I can say, I think that we can say that there is a notion of integration process going on on the Europe during the last half of the century. And uh, if we add to this uh, uh, activities within the EU, those processes which are going on within the NATO, within the Council of Europe, within the uh, OSCE, I think this all produced, produces a kind of a strong integration synergy. And I think this is the most uh, a valuable part of the European history during the last half a uh, century. Uh, and I think this is uh, this what uh, presents the European soft power, which is globally attractive and, and uh, uh, useful to say so. And when we speak uh, about these events from this point of view, uh, I think that we can say that there are uh, many actors which are part which are part of this uh, integration process and which are not members of the e EU and m maybe some uh, also we will not be who are out, let's say, geographically uh, more away uh, from, from Europe. But uh, looking from this point of view and speaking about the special issue of this our journal and about your respected country, we can say that at least for more than 10 years, 10, 15 years, your country is part of this integration process. There is a customs union between EU and Turkey, Turkey, uh, uh, and even before that, as a, when NATO and the EU, after the end of the Cold War, started to cooperate together, with this fact, Turkey became part of the inter European integration process. And uh, uh, from this point of view, I think uh, this... Uh, Political, politically motivated blocking of uh, almost half of the chapters, uh, this does not prevent the fact, and this must not uh, take our attention away from the fact that Turkey is part of the 
integral part of the European integration process. Uh, it is not the EU member yet, but it is part of the process as such, and I think this is important. And uh, uh, whatever positive or negative approach we would have to the uh, uh, contemplating of these facts, I think this, this, this should be the starting point. And this should be also the motivation for uh, 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 continuation of this, what uh, uh, your respective country is doing within the uh, uh, process of as, as a candidate country coming closer to the European uh, EU membership. Let me add here at least two experiences from the uh, one decade long Slovene negotiation process. Uh, uh, we started late 90, 1994 and uh, became members of the first, uh, uh, in, in the first of May 2004. So it took us a decade of very hard and demanding uh, intensive work to to uh, get the membership. During that period, uh, Slovenia witnessed uh, two uh, periods when we were, uh, how should I say, the target, the object, the victim, whatever you say, of a politically motivated blockade. Uh, it was for the first time during uh, spring 96. I don't know if you would remember this, uh, maybe not, but uh, at that time, uh, the so-called mad cow disease uh, appeared in, in uh, the UK and when the EU adopted a decision not to uh, import cow meat from uh, UK to the other parts of the EU, of the Europe, the uh, British government uh, responded with the blockade, blockage, uh, 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 the uh, British government blocked the negotiation process for the 10 countries which were there uh, uh, negotiating with, with the EU, that the blockade was lasted for, I think, four or five months, something like that, and also Slovenia was part of that blockade. So, so uh, this is one uh, act or one important similarity which we have from our uh, negotiation process and which is similar with your position now. So, we didn't have to do with this anything, uh, just you know, we were part of the negotiation group and we were hit by that blockade. Uh, next uh, similar experience happened, uh, I think, in 96, 97, not sure anymore, but it doesn't matter, in the second part of the 90s. Uh, our Western neighbor, uh, Italy, uh, when we started a real negotiation process, uh, when we st started as a candidate country, uh, in a certain period, at the beginning of our candidate, uh, of our uh, negotiation process, uh, blocked the process with the politically motivated gesture, saying that Slovenia has to amend constitution immediately and to change the constitution that way that the uh, uh, citizens of the EU will be uh, able to buy uh, property in Slovenia, real estate in Slovenia. According to the regulations, this should be changed at the end of the negotiation process, but our Western neighbors, they demanded this from us at the very beginning. So this was politically motivated, we can also say unfair, etc., etc. And after a year or something, uh, the Slovene government, with the, with the help of the, 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 of the then Spanish Foreign Minister Solana, found a kind of a way out of that uh, uh, deadlock, the, the solution is, is still called the, the Spanish Compromise. So I want to say that two times in our 10 years history of high engagement and negotiation process with the EU, we were uh, target, object or victim of a blockade which was purely political motivated and which didn't have anything to do with the process as such. So I want to say, as an ambassador, uh, now uh, that we understand this position of your country, uh, uh, judging from our own experience, we think this is not fair. We are supporting your uh, membership uh, fully as, as we can. Uh, but our experience also is, and this experience I'm trying to, you know, to, to, sp to spread around Turkey when I discuss this issue, uh, 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 although these two blockades happened to Slovenia, we continued with the negotiation process and with the reform process at high speed. We, of course, we were offended by these two facts, but we tried to uh, go over, you know, 
to step over these, these two burdens and to continue with the reform process because uh, we thought at that time, we still think that way, that the more we intensify the reform process, the higher, the stronger will our pressure as a candidate be on the, se on, 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 on the integration which we, will, which we wanted to be part of. This, I think this might be a very, experience, very useful experience for you. I think this experience in your case is highly pondered because you are an enormous country, I was told a continent, not only a country. So I'm sure that uh, uh, if your country will, will proceed with the tempo, with the high tempo of reform pr process, this will produce a pressure on the EU. It's physics. I hope that's physics. Now. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, plain physics, so you have this opportunity. Huh? You have this opportunity because you are a big country. Your case in the reform process is a unique in the history of, of the uh, uh, European integration process. And having in mind that the, the, the changes in the uh, uh, broader environment of Turkey on that part of the world, this speaks in favor of your country producing that kind of pressure on the EU. Uh, having said this, uh, I didn't uh, say I don't know, I don't know who knows when the negotiation process in your case will finish and when there will be a question, the topic of admitting in the membership, but uh, this is also a lesson from our experience. Now, I think it is important to focus on the process, of course also think about the, the, the the date, né? but I think it's good not to be uh, so uh, uh, occupied with the date that this will lower the activities. This is our, also our uh, uh, impression, and I think it's good to have this, this in mind, because all this creates the result of the process, and the result at the end uh, will, be, uh, will be available when the uh, reform process is ended. If I quote your EU minister, Egeman Baish, uh, he, he uh, I think, said at many occasions that uh, at the, the current situation in the EU-Turkish relations uh, could be uh, uh, described with two brief sentences. Once, one, uh, firstly, the negotiation process is in a deadlock. Secondly, or the other way around, the reform process continues. I think, uh, judging from the Slovenian experience, this is the most important. And uh, if the, reform pro the more the reform process will continue, the more your country will get uh, 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 credit from the EU member, members, member countries for doing this. And the more there will be a pressure to move forward in spite of politically motivated blockades. Maybe I, I will stop here that, I, that this my introduction remarks will not uh, came out, uh, come out as, as a lecture, which is not intended to be. So uh, thanks once again for this opportunity. Uh, take in your hands this uh, uh, copy, the issue, take it with you. And I'm glad, glad once again and thankful for this opportunity to be uh, able to present this at the eighth round of this year discussions. Thank you. His Excellency, thank you very much. If, if you give me permission that we will have some questions. Is there any questions that we will have? Well, just introduce yourself because you know who I am and I don't have a clue who you are here. Uh, I'm a master's student, uh, modern Turkish studies program, uh, second year. Uh, and also I work for Today's Saman Daily. Uh, I would like to know what do you think uh, about the Europe crisis and its uh, possible implications on further enlargement of European Union. Uh, there is a discussion going on uh, in England, uh, David Cameron and uh, Ed Miliband, and also uh, Jose Manuel Barroso involved in that discussion that uh, European Union uh, must be more integrated uh, in terms of economic uh, cooperation uh, instead of uh, English or British concerns uh, their relations with European Union in the context of recent crisis. What do you think on, uh, on this issue and its implications, uh, possible implications for Turkish 
membership. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just answer yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for the, for the question. Well, uh, uh, from this, what you say, it seems that we are a kind of colleagues because I also was working as a journalist long ago, so I'm glad that I have a colleague over there to say so. Uh, I think at, at the moment this is the, the toughest period in the European EU history, this, this crisis. Uh, I, I don't know if it was uh, provoked or caused by the EU as such, but the uh, EU is part of, of the problem. This is in, in, inevitably, this is one thing. Second, uh, this uh, crisis has uh, uh, show, showed us or shown us the, the uh, relations with the, within the EU, within the member states, be, be, between the most important uh, bodies within the EU, uh, how flexible, how capable they are to, to cope with the new challenges and to a much of a, a extent uh, they or we, whatever you want, né, have been unprepared to do this. Né? Sometimes, you know, uh, it reminds me of that uh, joke saying when the first snow falls, né, people from the communal services say we were surprised by the snow, né? although it's 20th December. No? A kind of that situation. Né? Um, I think, I'm sure that uh, the most important uh, issue is to be able to maintain that the uh, integration flexibility of the EU, because this is on the long term the most important, and solving the, the Euro crisis is one of the cornerstones of, to, to, to remain this integration flexibility. This, this, I think it's simple and it is visible to, 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 to uh, everybody. I think that uh, European leaders will have to find solutions and uh, valid solutions and political strength to push through these sol solutions which will be or which are highly unpopular. It is obvious. I think it's also important that these solutions will not be just the reflection and the uh, result of, uh, let's say, an agreement between uh, all the he he uh, uh, heads of governments and the French president, or even less of them, but these uh, solutions have to, will have to be also the result of listening to the, to, the, to the EU population, the people, the NGO, the society. So I want to say that there should be more uh, democracy in this uh, 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 decision-making process in the EU than it has been so far. I remember, for example, after that big EU, uh, big bank in 2004, admitting 10 new members uh, uh, in, there were some discussions saying how come it is possible that, that, that a group of political leaders decide uh, uh, about such an important uh, issue as an enlargement process. So this should be, I think, also more, well, I don't know if the democratized, democratized is the right term, but there should be more uh, substance and, and uh, uh, contribution in these decisions that, uh, than only the decisions of the top politicians in Europe. Uh, with this, I think it will be also easier, or yeah, easier for those uh, p p decision makers to push through uh, decisions which, not, which will be not popular. I'm sure more or less everybody knows that the, what is the right way to proceed, and the more or less everybody knows that it's difficult to proceed that way. We humans are like that. We don't want to, to take some measures uh, for which we think they, they, are, they will harm us, but that they, they are positive for the end result. Uh, for the neighborhood, I think uh, uh, this, uh, this could be, I think, I'm not sure it, if it is, but, but I think this could be an opportunity also for the EU to, to strengthen relations with the with, with, the, with the countries around Europe, also with, with Turkey as a candidate country, because uh, especially EU and, and Turkey, they depend on each, on each other heavily. I think the uh, import-export rate between the EU generally and in the, the Turkey is about 65, 70 percentage, and it, it, it means investment, it means uh, how say high, high level cooperation results, not just buying and selling. So this could uh, uh, from one point of view, the Euro crisis could, or maybe it is already, I don't know, influence the Turkey, Turkey, Turkish vitality, the Turkish potentials, and the other way around, you know, the, the way how this will, uh, the, the crisis will be solved, it could, you know, uh, result in a highly uh, positive synergy and output. Enlargement process, uh, you mentioned in your beginning in the remarks, uh, at least five years we can hear remarks about the so-called enlargement fatigue, that, that 
big member countries uh, somehow tired of the enlargement process. And this Euro crisis just deepened this uh, impression, or maybe even more. This has put this enlargement issue on the margin of the discussions. This is, maybe this is understandable, but it's not good. It's not good, it's not normal, because if we look at the history of the EU, you know this better than I do, and we have, we have two, three articles in this issue saying, uh, presenting uh, to us a very, very visible, obvious conclusion that the enlargement process has been the driving force of the EU. That's the point. Of course, this does not mean that uh, we, we should create a kind of a mini United Nations out of the EU, but you know, this capability to be flexible, to, to, to uh, institutionalize, to, 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 uh, to turn to the neighborhood in an institutionalized way which will have a substance, fruitful goals, this is one of the most important, of, of the, uh, important aspects of the uh, EU identity as such. Uh, so I hope that these various experts will bring the synergy which will push things up. Uh, but we will see. We'll see how it May I abuse being a chair to ask a question? Yeah, yes, yes. Thanks, Dad. Actually, my question is relating to the Cyprus issue. That, you know, it's a hot issue between Turkey and the uh, um, Republic of Cyprus that Turkey did not recognize, and the Greeks, and also the, at the same time the Brussels did. But um, Turkey announced that in uh, 2012 July, that the uh, Republic of Cyprus will take to the presidency for six months. And then during that time, Turkey announced that we'll cut the relations with the EU. Uh, do you think that it will be possible, or what's the implications for Turkish EU relations for the cut of the relations in a, polit in a political sense? Or what's your. I remember from my student years, it's a long time ago, when we were discussing political science and politics, and somebody says that politics is the art of possible. Eh? So I hope that this will not happen and that the art of possible will bring some, some solution not, not to happen, because I think this will be, uh, uh, this will be a highly unproductive uh, issue. Eh? The politicians always have to find a solution. This is in the nature of the politicians, but if they don't find a solution, this is then something wrong. So I hope that this will not happen. But I understand this uh, announcement, this, such, some such statements from Turkish politicians. Uh, yeah, of course, th this is a kind of pressure to push and to find a solution and to push the process forward. I know far too less about these issues in detail that I will be able to, to comment on conditions and, and all these things, but I, I think that it is very important that, that all sides here that uh, will find a, a way how to proceed. Uh, uh, I think one of the uh, approaches, of course, is to see if and when some of those chapters which are not opened yet could be opened, that there will be some fresh impetus in, 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 the, in, the, in the negotiation process. This is very important. Uh, and I think if some things will, be, will move on on some areas, this will if, uh, inf influence other issues also. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, as speaking as an, let's say, as a uh, scholar, also as a diplomat, uh, I, I would not like to see that uh, there will be a situation where, where everybody will say, yeah, this is the main problem, we have to solve this, and otherwise nothing will, 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 will move on. Such situations, I think, are artificial in life. There are always issues where you can achieve some progress, and that progress affects then other issues. Now, I don't know if I can say, say more than this, uh, because I know far too less about these issues. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Slovenia and such, now we, we are supporting the... the the, the, the comprehensive uh, solution of the Cyprus issue, or what is the phrase, and we would like that this will not, uh, that this will be tackled and so that it will not, you know, burden the, the uh, enlargement process, which is already overburdened, to say so. And, uh, you know, uh, I think this is uh, also a huge challenge that uh, 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 strong, wise politicians in, in, in within the broader European uh, area, show the way forward. You know we, we, that we all face a kind of uh, uh, <coughs> Sorry, please. We face, uh, during the last five, six, maybe ten years, we have faced the 
uh, change of the generation in the European leadership and uh, one, of these, uh, conse one of the consequences of this change is that there is a shortage of European leaders which will be, you know, which, which could met, match with, with, with Kohl, Mitterrand, Schumann and so on. So this, is, uh, this situation is an opportunity for a leader to emerge. It's a challenge for everybody for the political leadership leaders in the, in the EU countries, in your respective countries, and so on. So, I mean, I hope that this will bring something out. But I would hardly imagine that the, uh, uh, in the second part of next year, everything will, will, will fully stop. Of course, it's possible. Eh? Everything is possible. But I, I would hardly imagine this. And uh, uh, I think that it is the duty of politicians, diplomats, and everybody else, civil society, to push, to press, that this will not happen. Thank you, His Excellency, that uh, Professor Milan Yazbets. Uh, I would like to thank you all that for joining us for today uh, for the debating the Turkey debating Turkey public lecture series relating to the presentation of the journal on European perspective. That uh, who do not take today any copy that you will find outside of the, the, the salon that you will take the one copy of the the journal. Thanks for uh, thanks for everyone for coming and joining us. Thank you very much.